Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to continue our retro breakdown series by cracking open the secrets of the Nintendo Wii GPU, codenamed Hollywood. This little chip powered legendary games like Super Mario Galaxy and Twilight Princess and many others with Nintendo's charm, but how did it work and how powerful was it? Well, it certainly wasn't the most powerful GPU of its generation, far from it actually, but it was efficient, compact, and perfectly tuned for Nintendo's vision. So today we're going to be breaking it all down, the hardware, the architecture, and even how it stacked up a little bit against its predecessor and what made it tick. That being said, if you are new to this channel and you do enjoy tech breakdown videos and reviews as well as other tech videos, consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads. And if you enjoy this video at all, make sure to hit that like button. That way YouTube will share this video to others who may enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all of you. Now let's get started. So first things first, what exactly is Hollywood? It's not just a GPU. It's actually a SOC or system on chip designed by ATI before AMD's acquisition of them. It's the same team actually behind the GameCube's flipper GPU. This GPU was unique in Nintendo's console history because instead of building something completely new, they actually took what worked with the GameCube and essentially refined it. Hollywood is built on a 90 nanometer process, later shrinking to 65 nanometers in newer revisions, and inside we've got multiple components packed into one package. This is what's called a multiple chip module, or MCM. The main star here is the Vegas die, which is the GPU and does all the heavy lifting for the graphics, I.O. and even audio processing. Inside Vegas, we've got three megabytes of of embedded DRAM, of which one megabyte is used for caching and two megabytes for Z buffering and frame buffers. The GPU runs at 243 megahertz clock speed and sports one vertex shader for geometry, four pixel shaders for blending and manipulation of textures, four texture mapping units for texture application, and finally four render output units to handle the final step of rendering. Then there is the NAPA, the second die, which holds 24 megabytes of 1T SR RAM, a fast memory pool that is shared between the GPU and the CPU. One little note I want to throw in here is later Wii revisions, codenamed Bollywood, combine these into a single chip to save power and space. This 24 megabytes of 1T SR RAM was further backed up by an additional 64 megabytes of GDDR3 RAM built into the motherboard for extra backup capacity and general use. Of this, up to 22 megabytes was reserved for the operating system in the unique ARM CPU core that also processed the operating system as well. But that will be for a different video in the future, and we will also discuss the RAM more later in this video. The Hollywood GPU may be starting to sound really familiar if you know about the GameCube specs or watch my video on it, and the reason for that is because the Wii's Hollywood GPU is basically a turbocharged version of the GameCube's flipper GPU. We have the three same megabytes of ED RAM in their allocations, the same 1T SR RAM. The Wii's GPU is even based off the same architecture. Hollywood basically just operated at a higher clock speed, coupled with some improvements in its memory in both capacity and bandwidth, as well as more texture units and the introduction of pixel shaders and a vertex shader, both of which which were not available on the GameCube GPU. So it may be obvious by now, but instead of going for cutting edge graphics improvements, Nintendo focused on refinement. And as you may have noticed when I broke down some of the deeper specs of the Wii's GPU, it also sticks with the same fixed function pipelines like the GameCube, meaning still no fancy programmable shaders like the Xbox 360 or PS3 of the same generation. But it still does have the same texture environment unit, or TEV, from the GameCube. This TEV was important because it can blend up to eight textures, like specular maps, diffuse maps, normal maps, and more across 16 stages, which is how games like Wind Waker on GameCube pulled off cell shading, or how Mario Galaxy achieved those glossy effects with character models without any issues. Certainly better to have in this scenario where having programmable unified shaders is not an option. Now I want to touch back on the RAM setup for the Wii that I briefly mentioned earlier to tie this all together and break it down more specifically. Basically, the Wii had 88 megabytes of total RAM, split into three types. The three megabytes of RAM built into and dedicated to the GPU, providing a total of 12.8 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth, 24 megabytes of 1T SR RAM shared between the IBM-powered Broadway CPU and the Hollywood GPU for game data and textures, and ran at 3.9 gigabytes a second, and finally 64 megabytes of GDDR3. RAM built into the motherboard for extra storage depending on need, but it was often used for extra video memory. And as I mentioned earlier, the Wii does reserve up to 22 megabytes of that GDDR3 portion for system tasks, leaving a total of 72 megabytes of RAM altogether available for games in the Wii. 
Overall, with a 50% boost in clock speeds over its predecessor, the much larger increase in RAM capacity with a boost in bandwidth, as well as other additions and hardware I mentioned earlier, the Wii was capable of about 18 million polygons per second with a peak fill rate of 972 million pixels per second, which basically gave it an overall 1.5 to 2 times the performance increase over its predecessor, the GameCube. Enough for smoother effects in games like Smash Bros. Brawl, and still having all the quick load times the GameCube was known for, even though Game Worlds could be larger and or with more objects in them. That being said, this GPU increase was a pretty minor one, so games did look better and have the ability of playing better on the Wii, but due to its limited intergenerational performance increase in its hardware, we weren't seeing the same kind of gains that we saw, let's say, from a PlayStation 2 to a PlayStation 3 or Xbox original to the Xbox 360, unfortunately, but that also wasn't Nintendo's vision either. And a lot of people already know that the Hollywood GPU in the Wii is certainly the underdog of its competitors. The PS3 and Xbox 360 all had state-of-the-art hardware for its time, with hardware features and graphics capabilities just not possible on the Wii. Even at a basic level and talking about just clock speeds, the 360 and the PS3 ran at more than twice the speed of the GPU in the Wii, both at 500 and 550 megahertz respectively, and were capable of pushing out 720p or higher HD resolutions in many games. And the Wii, on the other hand, topped out at the same 480p resolution as the GameCube. No HD textures, no crazy shaders or high definition graphics, just optimized visuals with Nintendo's charm behind them. So that's basically the Hollywood GPU inside the Wii in a nutshell. More of what would be considered a mid-generation refresh today, hardware improvement wise, all built on the GameCube DNA. But as we discussed already, that is okay too, because Nintendo did not focus on getting the highest end hardware in their system, and it has been that way for Nintendo ever since. Nintendo bet on and still continues to bet on gameplay and innovation over raw graphical power, and the Wii delivered despite the hardware that it has, helping it sell well over 100 million units. And personally, I never owned a Wii, but I respected what it was able to do. At the time that the Wii was out, I was also in high school, and back then all my friends and people in school would talk about would be playing Halo 3 on Xbox Live or Killzone 2 on the PlayStation Network. And my options and what games or consoles I could own back then were very very limited. So those were the consoles I had. It actually wasn't until the Nintendo Switch launch day that I would ever own a Nintendo console again. Before that, the last Nintendo console I owned was the GameCube. But I did manage to play the Wii at friends' houses and whatnot and enjoyed party style games and of course first party games I've always been a fan of. But I must admit I was into the whole power thing back then too and the most powerful consoles is what I wanted to have. But I do think back and regret that I did not get that personal time with the Wii that I think I would have enjoyed if I actually managed to have the the option of owning one back then. And I really do love the way Nintendo focuses on being different and just the fun part of gaming. That's why I still enjoy playing their games today and am very much so looking forward to the Nintendo Switch 2 coming out, hopefully within the next three to six months. But that's all I have for you in today's video. As always, before we go, I want to thank you so much for being here today and watching this far in the video. You seriously are a real one. So please comment below if you watch to the end or even just a suggestion on a console GPU or other hardware that I should cover in a future video and I'll add it to my list. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great morning morning, noon, evening, or night. And until next time, I wish you peace. Keep on gaming. Have a great day.